Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Eli Frakes in this segment. He's joining us here as a scientific director of women's health and U.S. medical affairs at AbbVie. He's going to talk about some data that AbbVie presented at ACOG Clinical Scientific Meeting 2022 on the use of Orlisa. Give us a brief look into your professional background, if you would. Sure, Neil. I finished a PhD in pharmacology at the University of Iowa, where I studied basic science of chronic pain. I've spent the past 15 years working in the medical side of the pharma industry, most of which in medical affairs supporting commercialized products. Today, as you mentioned, I serve as a scientific director in our U.S. Medical Affairs Division at AbbVie. And as a part of medical affairs, our mission is really to bridge patients, providers, and payers, translating that science to brighten health and lives. Now, uh, this information that was presented at uh, ACOG 2022, what is the significance of this uh, this data? Sure. Um, endometriosis treatment really must be individualized. And prior to the FDA approval of Elagolix in 2018, treatment options were really limited, giving women with endometriosis few choices if they wish to delay or avoid surgical procedures. Orlisa or Elagolix is an oral medication currently indicated for the management of moderate to severe pain associated with endometriosis. And the registration program had demonstrated it significantly reduced the three most common types of endometriosis pain. And while it's currently available as 150 milligrams once a day or 200 milligrams twice a day for up to 24 months or six months respectively. But when it was approved, that 200 milligram dose For only up to six months, we know that endometriosis is a very long journey. And having the two doses allows healthcare providers and patients to really individualize treatment, selecting that dose really based upon their symptoms. This particular data was the an interim cut of a longer study looking at the safety of the 200 milligram dose for up to 24 months. That being the important part, um, while not approved yet, that being the important part of the opportunity to assess that treatment over a longer duration. So very briefly, describe what endometriosis is and talk about some of the uh, concerns with side effects with the aforementioned compound and dosage. Sure. Endometriosis is thought to be an estrogen-dependent disease that can start as early as menses in women. So as you might imagine, all the way from menses up to menopause, it can be a very long journey. These endometrial endometrial lesions can be in a variety of different spots within the internal body and often cause um, a variety of different symptoms, the most disruptive being a chronic pain or chronic pelvic pain. The treatment options when you talk about hormonal suppressive therapy, like a GnRH antagonist, like Oralissa, is reducing that estrogen uh, level in the body. And if you reduce it too far, you can get hypoestrogenic effects, like hot flushes, which women usually can experience very rapidly, or more long-term options, potential options like bone loss. This particular data set, and by with the 200 milligram dose, you get a more significant suppression of estrogen FDA limited the duration to six months because of that potential risk of bone loss. And so this particular study went to look to see what happens on the efficacy and safety of the product if you add back a little bit of estrogen and progestin to be able to help mitigate some of those potential side effects long term. Adding back, uh, you mentioned that it was a, a reduction in estrogen. So I'm assuming that this adding back, do you, is it an equal amount of estrogen that it's been reduced, or is it incremental, a small amount? Yeah, it's a small amount of, of adding back, both estradiol and progestin. Um, typically, this formulation is often used in hormone replacement therapy, and because the body, natural body system, is lowered below that level, um, giving a little bit of this extra estrogen replacement therapy helps to bring those estrogen levels back into a a level that helps to mitigate some of those side effects. Well, if you would expound on uh, the data that was presented, some more of the key findings, if you would. Sure. So this particular abstract really was presenting predominantly that bone mineral density data. So this was a 48-month study. The first 12 months were placebo-controlled. 
the patients, there was one group of patients that started on 200 milligram plus ad back for the entire duration. There was one group that was on placebo for 12 months and then switched to 200 milligrams plus ad back, as well as one group that was on 200 milligrams alone without ad back therapy, switched to ad back after six months per the FDA guidance to date, and then followed over what will be up to a 36 month extension period. This particular abstract was focused on months 12 to 24, predominantly looking at the bone mineral density changes. Those bone mineral density changes are assessed with a DEXA scan. They're done every six months throughout this particular study and will be continued. And the data that was presented here looked at lumbar spine, total hip, and femoral neck as the three most common areas assessed for bone mineral density. Why those three areas? Those three areas have a little bit of a different bone concentration and bone makeup, which allows a, uh, researchers and clinicians to be able to assess um, potentially subtle changes that might happen across uh, the various aspects of, of bone and bone health. And so when you looked over the course of the 24 months, you can see that uh, really regardless of location, you see about a 1% uh, to a little bit less than 1% depending on the group, about a 1% about decrease in bone mineral density changes over the course of the two years of therapy. I heard you mention uh, earlier in our conversation uh, three types of endometriosis. Were these bone density issues studied in all three types or levels of endometriosis in this particular study? Um, to clarify, um, endometriosis can manifest in a variety of different symptoms. It's not known that endometriosis has itself a direct impact on bone or bone health. Mm -hmm. the, the three types or the three areas of bone we're really looking at those particular areas that may be impacted by some sort of estrogen suppression therapy, like Elagolix or Oralissa. So there really isn't a whole lot of uh, direct correlation between bone um, and endometriosis. So what do these findings mean ultimately uh, for endometriosis patients and providers alike? Yeah, so if approved uh, to be able to use the 200 milligram plus uh, add back for endometriosis, if approved by the FDA, uh, it'll allow one additional option for women that may need greater estrogen suppression therapy to be able to manage their endometriosis pain over a longer period of time, longer than six months. We know this is a long journey and often a, a difficult journey for women with endometriosis and providing them one additional option and providing providers one additional tool in their tool belt to be able to manage this condition over a longer period of time. Is there anything that you'd like to add for our listeners and then give us uh, some information where our listeners can learn more? Sure. As you mentioned, endometriosis is a difficult and challenging condition, not only for the patients, but the providers that they treat. And our uh, gratitude goes out to those that are on that journey. Hopefully this will be one additional option that'll help. If providers are looking for more information, there's a couple of different places they could go if they're wanting to see something specific to the abstract. www.acog.org, the American College of Gynecology, is where this abstract was presented. Or if you have specific questions for us in AbbVie Medical Affairs, you can go to abbviemedinfo.com uh, for a lot of additional information about our products and ways to get a hold of us should you have any additional questions. Dr. Frakes, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. We've been in conversation with Dr. Eli Frakes, Scientific Director of Women's Health and U.S. Medical Affairs at AbbVie. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to to our YouTube channel at youtube.com health professional radio.